In the spring, my husband and I got to chaperone our son's senior class trip to Greece and Rome. Although I didn't have a YouTube channel back then, as an artist, there was so much inspiration that I just have to share it with you. When you think of traveling to Greece, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Visiting the Parthenon, of course, and for good reason. After all, it is the oldest structure in the world still standing and still in use today. However, did you know there is a fascinating story behind what was on the Acropolis before the Parthenon was there? And there's also a lesson for us artists that I think will ring true for you as well. Join me on my mini tour to a few days in Greece. When first arriving, we stopped at the Pan-Athenaic Olympic Stadium, built entirely of marble over the site of the first modern Olympic Games, which happened in 1896. The original Olympic Games and the stadium were in ancient Olympia. We then drove past the statue titled The Runner, made of thousands of plates of glass, and then past Parliament, where we could see the Honorable Evzone Guard standing stock still. They aren't allowed to move even a muscle. Once an hour they change places, and people flock to watch this pretty cool spectacle. The shopping district feeds into a tourist zone, which has some kit shops for souvenirs, flea markets with great finds, basilicas with a feast of artistic details. Just look at all the beautiful motifs carved and painted on the walls and the ceiling. And then there are more sandal shops, as well as places you could buy Greek seasonings. We came multiple times to this Monasteraki shopping district to find gifts for our friends and family back at home, but our favorite was this little tiny artist studio where we could buy paintings. We returned at night and were surprised to see the plaza full of people hanging out under the glow of the Acropolis high above. There were still peddlers selling trinkets, such as the glowing helicopter toys, which they managed to land at your feet, hoping you would pick it up and then you'd have to pay for it. Musicians played and people ate pastries and sat around chatting with friends. But let's get to the story I mentioned earlier. Before the Parthenon was built on the Acropolis, there was an earlier temple built to the goddess Athena, which was destroyed when King Xerxes raided the Acropolis in 480 and 479 BC. Yes, that's the same king who later made Esther his queen. Yes, the Esther of the Tanakh in the Bible. Xerxes was the son of Darius the Great and daughter of Atosa. Atosa's father was Cyrus the Great, and Darius had wanted to expand the Persian Empire and Xerxes wanted to continue his father's dream. Ten years earlier, Darius was defeated at the naval battle of Marathon, and Xerxes returned to see what he could conquer. He sacked the Acropolis and set up camp around the islands, only retreating back to his royal city of Persepolis when he lost at the Battle of Salamis. A new Parthenon temple was built to Athena on the Acropolis, and it was dedicated in 438 BC. Though the temple and the Acropolis has been raided many times and many pieces and statues have been carted off, enough original designs still remain to give us a glimpse of its former glory. The greatest shock to me was learning that recent cleanings have showed the original white marble used to be brightly painted in reds, blues, greens, and gold. All my life I've thought of ancient Greek art in terms of white and shades of gray. However, there are plenty of historical accounts of eyewitnesses writing about seeing colored statues when visiting Greece, but this knowledge was somehow lost to us over the past 100 years. When our guide walked us through the museum, she pointed out beautiful, brightly painted Koray maiden statues, which were recently dug up. They were so beautiful, with braided hair and elaborate tunics, but we weren't allowed to take photos, so I can't show them to you. Then she told us to look carefully at some statues, asking us who they remind us of. They were tall, straight, had the left foot forward and the arms by their side. She said, the ancient Greeks were inspired by the Egyptians. After she pointed that out, it was so clear to see the progression of early ancient Greek statues, which looked almost entirely Egyptian, only they were made of white marble instead of the Egyptian yellow sandstone to the progression of the classical Greek statues, which were a bit more elaborate, to the Hellenistic refined epitome of beauty statues we think of when we think of Greek art. 
This proves that artists have always looked to other art for their inspiration. Austin Kleon has a book out titled, Steal Like an Artist, and it says the exact same thing. We artists aren't original. We borrow from multiple sources, and over time we develop our own personal style which has tidbits of this and that and the other. Don't you think that knowing the ancient Greeks did this is astounding, and it gives you permission to do the same? I want to ask you, what historic art styles inspire you? What elements do you like to incorporate in your art? Another interesting aspect was that the Greeks believed in holistic medicine, and they still do today. They wanted to treat the whole body. Ancient doctors prescribed going to the theater because they felt that patients could see themselves in the characters, learn from their mistakes, gain perspective, and then desire to change their lives for the better. In fact, there is a medical clinic below the Acropolis near the Dionysus Amphitheater where one could be treated and then go attend a show at the theater. Doctors knew that how a person felt, including the condition of one's soul, as well as their body aches, they were related and healing can only happen when all is taken in consideration. There are even marble carvings of the ear, eye, and leg, and other things like that in the museum referencing these beliefs. The higher amphitheater, the Odeon of Herodes Atticus, which seats 5,000, regularly holds concerts overlooking the city of Athens. It would be amazing to attend a show here at night, but there was none going on. After enjoying the wind and view on top of the Acropolis, we made our way a short distance to Mars Hill, where the Apostle Paul spoke to the Athenians about their worship of an unknown god. One of our students read a bit in Greek, and we sat and contemplated what Paul would have felt like standing here in view of the Grand Parthenon while reasoning with the crowds. People liked to discuss worldviews back then, just as they do today. After stopping by the Agios Lucas Gorge, we found ourselves in ancient Corinth, my favorite spot in Greece. Paul spent 18 months living here, working as a tent maker and teaching the people to love God. We stood at the Bema seat, yep, that's the right pronunciation, where Paul defended himself before the magistrates. On the mountain above sits the ruins of a medieval castle. Ancient Corinth rests quietly, overgrown by grass and flowers, in a small village with small lemon trees lives peacefully nearby in the shadows of an ancient pass which once was a grand, thriving city. We toured a small museum full of local treasures and lots of statues with their heads cut off. That's what every raiding army did. And I saw some small horse and chariot statues. I look for them wherever I go. I love the idea that children played with horses back then and still do today. Outside the museum, I found myself staring at an unusual plant, which the guide told me was the acanthus plant. No way! I've always wondered where the inspiration for the Corinthian capital came from, and here it was, right in front of me. No wonder the Corinthians designed their columns with these leaves on it. This plant was everywhere, once I knew what to look for. An impromptu stop at the ancient port city of Sincrea, where Paul left the Greek mainland by boat, revealed remnants of an ancient wharf standing in shallow water. It was amazing to imagine the people who had lived here long ago, bustling about, getting ready to travel. We waded knee-deep, cooled off from the heat, and collected tiny pebbles of all colors. Our last night in Greece treated us to a cultural lesson on olive oil pressing by a family who has bottled olive oil for decades complete with a tasting with bread and herbs, then fine dining on the absolute best food of our entire trip. Fresh salads, feta cheese, grilled eggplants, and peppers, meatballs, lamb, moussaka, baked fish, and lemon potatoes were some of what we ate. Many other guests, like us, filled our plates over and over again as traditional dancers entertained us with their folk dances, then grabbed us out of our chairs and got us throwing plates on the dance floor. It was like a huge Greek wedding. Sleepy 
eyed but still alert due to our hilarious British guide, who is not a day younger than 80, but wore a high ponytailed bleach blonde braid and 42 rings on her fingers, well, she got the bus driver to stop on the precarious edge of the road for a final look at the city of Athens at midnight. It was magnificent. What travels have you made that you can weave into your art? If you haven't gone anywhere, just think of the ancient Corinthians who used the common acanthus leaf and created those beautiful Corinthian columns. What bits of nature do you have around you that you can incorporate into your personal art style? If you like this video, you might want to watch the next one, which is going to be about our travels in Rome. There was so much inspiration there, and I can't wait to share it with you. If you want to see more, please hit subscribe because it helps me to know that you like to watch these videos for I create them with you in mind. Now, what kind of art are you going to go make today?